Well, good morning again, and uh, welcome to Crossview. I just had to try it on for size. Scott's gotten to say it a few times. I haven't yet. So um, I'm Nate Johnson, the worship and student ministry, et cetera, um, here at the church. And we're just glad to, to be together here in person and hello to our online community as well. And uh, I get to bring the word today, which Scott and I were talking before, and he says, it's so nice when you get to preach. And I said, I bet it is. Um, but it's just good to, to bring the word um, I love getting to spend the time in the study and, and bringing a talk together. And, um, and I always like to look for inspiration. And uh, I'm, a, I'm a book reader. My wife will tell you I'm a book reader. I listen to Audible and podcasts, probably to a fault. Um, but I love being inspired by words. And I think that's kind of a universal thing. And I believe that we can all get behind a good string of inspirational words. We all have our favorite movie quotes, or we have our favorite person that has had said some awesome things, or we like to think of some of the funny things they've said too. But I just want to share a few quotes or sayings that I, th I think we are all somewhat familiar with, maybe not on some of these quotes. But uh, my first one I have for us today is, you'll never find a rainbow if you're looking down. Does anyone know who said that? I won't do this on every single one, I promise. That was from Charlie Chaplin. If you don't know, ask your grandparents. Maybe your parents would know who Charlie Chaplin is. One, a great film director, actor, and so on um, from the 1920s and 30s. Hope can never be taken away. Martin Luther King Jr. said that in one of his speeches. Although the world is full of suffering, it is also full of overcoming it. That was from Helen Keller. Do what you can with what you have where you are. That was from our 26th president, my personal favorite, Theodore Roosevelt. Why do we fall so we can learn to pick ourselves up? Does anyone know what that one's from? It's from Alfred Pennyworth from Christopher Nolan's The Dark Knight. If you're a Batman fan, that might have sounded familiar. <laughs> Movie fan as well, I'll, I'll admit it. Stand for something or you will fall for anything. Today's mighty oak is yesterday's nut that held its ground. That's from Rosa Parks. And uh, I love that. That was a new quote to me this last week. I'm holding on to that one. I really like that. The final one that we might be familiar with is, is a saying that we sometimes hear in, in Christian circles and, and even in the rest of the world too, is God won't give you anything you can't handle. When we hear quotes like these or certain phrases, they can tend to energize us. We can get inspired to, inspired to do amazing things. We can pick ourselves up when we get knocked down. We feel better. Maybe we laugh, but maybe we feel comforted too. Now I have to ask, do you feel the same way when you go to Scripture? When you, when you crack open your Bible for your daily devotional or you pull out your smartphone and swipe through pages of apps to find your Bible app and say, yeah, God, I am ready to go. Do you feel the same way when you pray? When we say, God, I'm here to talk. Lord, hear my prayers. God, I need help. Or God, I'm listening. Lead me. Do you feel the same way when God does something amazing in your life? Maybe you get a job promotion or um, you win something or you find out that your wife and you are having twins, like amazing things happen. Did anyone else have that happen this week? Oh, just me, okay. If you didn't know, we're expecting times two, so yeah. <laughs> The youth group got very excited. I'm like, you guys have no idea. Uh, no one else had that happen this week? Uh, my final question is, do you feel the same way? Do you feel energized when you're waiting for God to move? I don't think many of us would say yes to that. Maybe we would ask another question is, God, what are you up to? When we look around at our world, and, and Tom put it very eloquently earlier, we can look around, we can all often wonder, God, seriously, what are you up to? Lord, look at our world. Look at all the things that are going on. I could spend the next hour going through all the things that happened in the news cycle in the last week, but we try to be done by 1030, so I'm not going to do that today. But we, we look at all the things, so much unrest, so much tension, and so much division in our world. And it can become very easy to look around at all of it and wonder, not just, God, what are you up to, but 
where are you? Well, today, I believe we can look to the story of Habakkuk and gain some wisdom from his experience in the Old Testament. Now, today, I promise we're just doing a flyover of Habakkuk, but I encourage you this week to go and, and take some time to read through it in your, in your study time. It's a short book. It's only three chapters, but it's, it's a really interesting story. And just to give you a little bit of backstory, if you don't know who Habakkuk is, um, right away in his, in his book, he identifies himself as a prophet. Right away in the first verse, hi, I'm Habakkuk, I'm a prophet. Now, some believe he was a temple prophet, and they're often described as being, as using lyres and harps and cymbals. Uh, so we could deduce that Habakkuk was most likely a Levite and also a singer in the temple. It's Good, good guy. Um, now, there is no other information, though, on Habakkuk. In fact, less is actually known about him other than, and actually nothing, not much is known about him uh, other than any other writer in the Bible. Like, there's nothing other than there's a book of Habakkuk. That's all we have information-wise for him. Now, the major theme of his book is to grow from a faith of perplexity and doubt to having absolute trust in God. And Habakkuk addresses his concerns over the fact that God is using the Babylonian army, uh, an empire, an enemy of his nation, to put judgment on the nation of Judah for their sins against God. So we'll turn to Habakkuk 1, 2 through 4, and it'll be on the screen. How long, Lord, must I call for help and you do not listen or cry out to you about violence and you do not save? Why do you force me to look at injustice? Why do you tolerate wrongdoing? Oppression and violence are right in front of me. Strife is ongoing and conflict escalates. This is why the law is ineffective and justice never emerges. For the wicked restrict the righteous, therefore justice comes out perverted. When we look at our world today, when we look around, we can see there's some bad stuff going on. It's it's pretty easy to see that. And we're living in hard times. And while we can look around and all we can see is just the darkness rising, we have to remind ourselves that there is a God who cares about us, and uh, He is with us in this storm. Now, most of us have been through a season like this. I, I think we can all say we've been through a lot of things. Maybe not a pandemic, maybe you have, but um, we, we can at least kind of maybe rule that one out. But we've all had, had our seasons of darkness. Maybe we've had someone we love uh, pass away. Maybe we've had a falling out with a really good friend because we had a disagreement or a life change happened. Or we've received a bad diagnosis from our doctor and the situation doesn't look good. Well, today I'd like to share with you all a story um, about a dark season that my family and I went through just a couple years ago. Back in the fall of 2018, um, my family had the worst week of its life, just the worst week ever. Both Ellie and Becca were sick. And it was, on a, it was the Wednesday after Thanksgiving, and um, we all got up, and Ellie was just unresponsive. She just didn't want to get out of bed, and she wasn't moving. So we ended up taking her to the ER, and they had to intubate her. They had to put the tube down her throat so she could breathe. And they ended up airlifting her to Iowa City, where she was diagnosed with RSV, double pneumonia, and a collapsed lung. And, but uh, Ellie was only two months old at the time. So add that into the mix. And she was a preemie, so I mean, the, the list was just working against her. But Ellie was two months old and at the time, and the thing is, is she fought. And anyone that's served in the nursery, they have seen Ellie, like, girl is a fighter. Um, but she fought so hard. So by f- that Friday, uh, she was showing some improvement. Her lungs started to improve, and she actually woke up, and we got to see her eyes. It was the best thing. So Christine and I, that Friday, we actually closed on our house. So I got to go home and be with Becca and prepare for our move. And Sunday morning rolled around, and Becca, who had also been sick for a couple weeks, was not doing too well. So I took her to the ER, and they tested her for strep and flu, and they also took her blood sugar, which I thought was a little odd. I Still kind of a new dad, so I'm kind of just rolling with it. And her flu and strep test came back negative, but her blood sugar was over 400. And the doctor informed me most likely that she was in what's called DKA, diabetic ketoacidosis. It's very complicated, Um, but she was not, she was unhealthy. And she was, we were told she was type one diabetic. Well, an ambulance ride later, and our family of four was in Iowa City, and our two little girls were three doors apart at the PICU at the U of I hospital. 
Now you can imagine, during this time, I was angry. I was mad that these horrible things were happening to my little girls. But God put amazing people in our lives. We had family and friends who were praying hard for our girls. And God gave me a godly woman to be married to that I could lean on and she could lean on me. And through it all, God, we were able to hold fast to God. Even though things got dark, he was there with us. And I was hurting and God healed that hurt. And the beautiful thing about Jesus is he turns wounds into scars. And I think how different a scar is from a wound. A wound hurts, a scar tells a story. A wound can get infected, but a scar is healed. A wound you tend to hide, a scar you show. We will tell our girls for years to come how God did an amazing thing through this dark season and not only kept our family safe, but kept us together by our faith in him and countless others' faith in him. So when we look back to Habakkuk, he has this back and forth with God that's very enjoyable. Um, God responds to him and puts him in his place. And in Habakkuk 1.5, God's first answer, look at the nations and observe Be utterly astounded, for I am doing something in your day that you will not believe when you hear about it. God goes on to remind Habakkuk of what he's done and that he needs to be patient. Remembering what God has done in the past gives us confidence to have faith in him. We know that he is always working. Pretty sure we just sang a song about that. Even when I don't see it, you're working. It's, he is still working. So we come to our, the next chapter. Chapter two starts off, uh, Habakkuk waits for God's response. He's, him and God, they're kind of having their back and forth. In Habakkuk two, one reads, I will stand in my guard post and station myself on the lookout tower. I will watch to see what he will say to me and what I should reply about my complaint. Now, as we continue Habakkuk's story, we see him waiting on God, expecting As we progress through the book of Habakkuk, he has, like I said, he has this back and forth with God, and God puts him in his place and reminds him, God is present always. To use three loaded church words, God is omnipresent, he is everywhere, he is omniscient, he knows all things, and omnipotent. He is all-powerful and able to do anything. Now, through that lens, we can know in Habakkuk's position that first, we know God was present because you know, omnipresence. He's everywhere. Uh, Second, that God knew Habakkuk's plight. His land had been invaded because God's omniscient. He knew what was going on. And third, that God is omnipotent. Now, I believe that this one matters the most right now. God was present. He was aware of the problem, but God didn't do anything right away. Not yet. But wait a minute. God is all-powerful, and he let Habakkuk's land be invaded by some really bad people. Why did this bad thing happen to a good person? I think how many of us have asked that question before? Why did something bad happen to a good person? Now, right out of the gate, I want you all to know that bad things happen to everyone. I don't want that to be Nate's inspirational quote for today, but that's just a thing for us all to remember, that bad things happen to everyone. And the thing is, is it's not dependent on whether they have faith in God or not. Bad things happen in our world because there is sin. When God created the earth, sin did not exist. He made all things, and at the end of the day, he repeatedly said, it is good. However, deception entered in when the first man, Adam, and his wife, Eve, decided they wanted to be like God. They wanted to have the knowledge that God had, and so humankind fell into sin, death, and destruction. And because of this choice, Bad things happen to us all. Think back to a time when you were really in trouble or struggling. You may have thought, where was God? He could take this pain away. He knew I was going to hurt. Why didn't he stop the pain from affecting me in the first place? Well, to go back to the beginning and restate one of our comforting phrases, God won't give you anything you can't handle. I'm assuming we have all heard that phrase at some point in our lives. I'm here today to tell you that it's untrue. It's twisting God's word. 1 Corinthians 10, 13, no temptation has come upon you except what is common to humanity. But God is faithful. 
He will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation, he will also provide the way out so that you may be able to bear it. Sometimes God does test our faith. Just as he tested the faith of the ancient Israelites by allowing them to go through the hard times in the wilderness, we read in Deuteronomy 8, 2, in order to know what was in your heart. Now remember, if our faith is weak, it may not be obvious when life is going smoothly. We might be like, hey, life is good, God's around, and we aren't challenged in any way. Nothing bad is happening. But when hard times come along, a weak faith will be revealed for what it really is, shallow and unable to help us through life's difficulties. It may be anything. It may be an unexpected illness, the death of a loved one, the loss of our job. But when hard times happen, the true nature of our faith will be revealed. But God doesn't test us because he doesn't know how strong we are. Instead, he tests us because we don't know how strong we are. And we'll only realize it when the time of testing comes. In Psalm 139, the psalmist prayed, search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. None of us like to go through hard times, and God isn't necessarily behind them, even if he does allow them. But God can use them to show us our weaknesses. And when that happens, we need to ask God to help our faith grow. Testing should make us spiritually stronger, and it will... And it will as we turn it over to God. We have to turn it over to him. We can't hide it and hold it to ourselves. The Bible says, consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials so that you may be mature and complete. That's from James 1, 2, and 4. So as I shared earlier, I'm I'm a bit of a reader. And and, um, actually, I came upon this really interesting fact about vineyards. So please hang with me as I uh, go down a little rabbit trail here. So I found out something interesting about vineyards. So there's, and farmers, you guys might enjoy this more than others. Um, there's this technique uh, in, in vineyards, it's called, used called dry farming. Now, most vineyards use drip irrigation, which we live in the Midwest, so driving along, we see the big apparatus out in the fields. A uh, lot of vineyards use drip irrigation, and that's to bring water to the plants. And while it's convenient, and it, and it makes having crops in places where there's not a lot of water, uh, it brings water directly to the plant, and it leaves the vine with a weak root system. Because it's just got water just coming straight to it, so it's doing fine. But the thing is, is the roots tend to have this weird onion bulb shape, and I tried to Google it, and I couldn't find a picture of it. Um, so instead of having those big, deep roots, it has this shallow root. So to use the dry farming technique, it takes years for a good root system to take place. And it can be costly to the vineyard because at first, it takes time. It takes time for those roots to grow deep. But what's good about that is when they do grow deep, they take in more nutrients from the soil and it produces a better crop, i.e. better wine. (laughs) Another benefit to this, these deep root systems, is when a storm comes along, the roots the roots keep the plant firm, keeps it firm in the ground, whereas a plant that uses drip irrigation will be washed away due to its shallow roots. And I read about this, not in a farmer's almanac or anything. I read it in Alan Fadling's book, An Unhurried Life. And he has this great insight comparing believers and the vineyards. So this is from his book. Many are quite dependent on someone else. He makes this comparison. Many are quite dependent on someone else, whether it's a pastor, a mentor, a teacher, providing them with nourishment from the outside. As a result, the root system is relatively underdeveloped. They have not learned nor have been expected to stretch out their roots to seek refreshment and nourishment for themselves. If churches and ministries were to redesign their efforts to be more intentional, intentional, about helping Christians find their nourishment in Jesus for themselves, there might be complaints and a loss of fruit for a season or a few seasons. But what might happen to the quality of these men's and women's lives as a result? How might they come to be so well-rooted that they would no longer be dependent on someone else for their growth and could in fact become a source of nourishment and refreshment for others? Such a dry farming experiment in a local church our ministry would be a worthy one. We need to let our roots in God grow deep, beyond just surface level. And we need to study his word, seek him in prayer, 
and live out our lives with God as our source of nourishment and refreshment. Not this world, not people, not things, not our jobs, God alone. And I want to say, I, as Tom was talking about the prayer group, this is a plug for Tom. Um, men, I encourage you to go and be a part of that. I think as men, we are called to lead our families, and it needs to start with prayer. And it's, it's us having a relationship with God. So men, go to that. It's going to be awesome. So we're going to come back to Habakkuk. In hearing all of this and knowing the depth at which we need to go with our relationship with God, he realized this, and this is how we're going to close out Habakkuk today with having faith. When we look at Habakkuk's words and remember his musical inclination, I, I tend to hear him kind of singing this. Uh, his words feel a little bit like a song. It's very poetic. So this is closing out Habakkuk 3, 16 through 19. It'll be on the screen. Habakkuk's confidence in God expressed. I heard and I trembled within. My lips quivered at the sound. Rottenness entered my bones. I trembled where I stood. Now I must quietly wait for the day of distress to come against the people invading us. Though the fig tree does not bud and there is no fruit on the vine, no fruit on the vines, though the olive crop fails and the fields produce no food, though the flocks disappear from their pen and there are no herds in the stalls, yet I will celebrate in the Lord. I will rejoice in the God of my salvation. The Lord, my Lord, is my strength. He makes my feet like those of a deer and enables me to walk on the mountain heights." Folks, when life gets you down, remember, I am in the hard places for my goodness and his glory. God's the one who's going to get you through the tough times, through his strength, not our own. My prayer for you all today in this very brief summary of Habakkuk uh, is that you would go and read it. Um, my prayer is that, you, that we would all grow to have that Habakkuk kind of faith that we see in chapter three. But the thing is, you can't have a chapter three type of faith until you've had a chapter one type of question or dark, season of darkness and a, and a chapter two kind of waiting. Because God often does more spiritually in the valley than he does on the mountaintop. Now, I don't have all the answers to your questions, but after loving God and serving Christ most of my adult life, here's what I can say. I've walked with Jesus for enough yesterdays to trust him with my tomorrows. And we often vow to give God our future. We say, God, I give you my future. We give, I give you it all. And we say this with great aplomb and heroic virtue, but the future is easy to give God for the simple fact that we don't have it. All we have is right now, this moment, the present, the here and now. This moment, this pain that we might be going through, the joy that we might be having, the gratitude, the surrender. And the more moments we slowly and gratefully turn over to God, the more we tap into his joy. Now, Habakkuk may not be the most popular baby name. I'm just getting that out there. We're not naming one of our twins Habakkuk. I mean, Habby's kind of a cute name. No, it's not. Uh, but what's cool about the name Habakkuk is the meaning, which I, I, I will tell you, Christine and I have already like, started talking about what do we want to name them? Um, not Habakkuk. Um, but it's, I love getting to learn the meaning of, of names. And Habakkuk comes from the Hebrew word kavach. And um, I'm not clearing my throat. That was kavach. And it means embrace. But it also has another meaning. It means to wrestle. Now, when I think of wrestling and embracing God, I think of my little girls. When I come home and they come running to me, Dad, you know, it's, they come running. They come up to give me a big bear hug, and they give me a hug when they're happy, when they're scared, and when they're in trouble. Arms around my neck, which if you watch, Ellie will show up, and she's going to probably like choke hold me later. Um, but their arms are around my neck using all their strength in a hug. And I think of God in that way when we can run to him with our arms open, ready to wrestle and embrace him, both at the same time. Let's pray. <sighs> Heavenly Father, Lord, we are here. Lord, we, we, we think on you when we are in our dark places, when we're struggling. God, Help us to see you so that we can come running with our arms open to embrace you 
and to work with you. God, I just pray for our, our church family. I think of all that we're all going through right now, God, and that list is endless. Help us to remember who holds the future, who loves us through our good and our bad times, when we're difficult, maybe when we mouth off, maybe when we're frustrated. Help us to remember the love that you have for us, that we are your children, that you think of what's best for us. And even when it's hard, it is for your glory and you are working for our good because you love us, God. We love you, Heavenly Father. We lift it up in Jesus' name. Amen.